Welcome to Role Playing History, the podcast where we examine the history of role playing games. I'm Wayne Davis, and I'll be your guide for today's tour. Episode 5 Role Playing Games from 1980 to 1984. Now, before we jump back onto the timeline of role playing games, I need to take a minute to both correct and update something I said a couple of weeks ago. Back in episode 3, when we talked about the history of TSR, I noted that the rebirth of TSR in 2011 by Jason Elliott had shut down after the collapse of Gygax magazine. Based on what I'd found at the time, or more specifically what I hadn't found at the time, I believed that that was the case. However, I have since gotten more information confirming that his version of TSR Games is still in operation, still producing games. However, there's an update. E. Gary Gygax Jr., the son of Gary Gygax and Elliot's former partner in Gygax Magazine, is the head of a new TSR Games based out of Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. Per comicbook.com, the announcement was made earlier last week, the week of June 15th, and this new version already has a game to produce and released called Giant Lands, with another one on deck called Tales and Tots. So not only do we still have one TSR Games, we actually have two, which is going to get real interesting. Alright, so now that I've corrected myself and offered up an update... Let's get the new tour started by hopping back into the timeline. In 1980, a new publisher, Iron Crown Enterprises, brought a new game to the market, Rollmaster. Created by Coleman Charlton, John Curtis, Pete Fenland, and Steve Martin, Rollmaster was another foray into the fantasy gaming realm. Rollmaster brought several new or different concepts to the gaming world. The first was the idea of concussion hits, which weren't deadly. This is the first instance I can find of non-lethal damage in a role-playing game. The second thing was the idea of open-ended die rolls. Some gamers listening to this, you can compare that to the idea of exploding dice, like in Vampire and other games. For Rollmaster, the gist was this. If your roll result was high enough, or low enough, you would re-roll and add or subtract the results from the first roll. If that roll was high enough or low enough, the process continued. In real terms, what it meant is a halfling could drop a giant with a dagger in one hit. Granted, it'd have to be one hell of a well-placed and lucky shot, but it could be done based on the rolls. One final add-on was a critical hit table that included not only the type of hit, crushing, slashing, etc., but also severity, ranked A to E, E being the most severe. There was also a hit location, so players could track hits. Oh, and and this all applied to the NPCs as well, so it meant that a low-level, lightly armored character would probably have a short life expectancy. But this game has had a long life expectancy. It, It survived. Four editions were published by Iron Crown Enterprises before they closed their doors in 2000, and several reprints have been released by other companies, the most recent coming out in 2008. Reviews are basically the same. Heavy on math. Heavy on charts. But if those were your thing, this was your game. In 1981, Chaosium did something really different. But it requires a little backstory. There have been several attempts over the years to figure out how to tie non-fantasy games and rules into a single system. AD&D was the system pretty much everybody was using because it was the most popular system out there at the time. TSR tried to do this with Gamma World and Boot Hill. However, while those games were fun and somewhat popular, the system adjustment just really didn't work long term. So, Chaosium decided to try something different. In 1981, they released Basic Role-Playing. Created by Greg Stafford and Lynn Willis, it was first released in the 1980 boxed set second edition of RuneQuest. Now, I have to note that Stafford and Willis pared down the system that was originally written by Steve Perrin. 
their idea was to create a generic set of rules that could be applied across genres. In other words, you can play a fantasy game, a sci-fi game, or maybe even a Western game with basically the same rules. Again, the rules were stripped down because the idea was that the sci-fi game, fantasy game, or Western game would plug the specifics of their genre into the system base. Now, BRP separates armor from defense, and that's one of the first times this particular adjustment was made in a role-playing game. Another big change is that in BRP, there was no difference between PC races and monsters. That allowed players an opportunity to play a lot of non-human species. For the record, basic role-playing is still published by Chaosium today. In 2020, it was released as a system reference document, which is the basic document for an RPG's mechanic under the open game license. Open game license will come up in a longer form another time, but for right now, let's just note that OGL, Open Game License, allows other publishers to publish works using your system so long as they follow the system reference document and the rest of the terms of the OGL. Like I said, we'll expand on that in another episode. While most reviews said that basic role-playing would be a good way to teach gaming to newcomers, many also called that system too little too late. But I find it I find it humorous that some critics didn't like BRP because it was the base of Call of Cthulhu, which was also released in 1981. As the title implies, this game is Lovecraftian horror based on the HP Lovecraft quote, the oldest and strongest emotion of mankind is fear, and the strongest kind of fear is fear of the unknown. The game moves along with the characters learning about the true horrors of the world. As that happens, they lose sanity, which was a new component introduced specifically for this game. Call of Cthulhu has a reputation in the gaming community for insane dead characters because character death in particularly gruesome manners is frequent. And pretty much everybody who's ever done a piece on gaming has done a Cthulhu joke. And Jolly Blackburn, I'm, uh, I'm talking to you, buddy. There have been seven editions of the game, and at any given time, somebody's playing this game somewhere in the world. Call of Cthulhu has also been adapted into video games, collectible card games, miniatures, and other supplements from other publishers. Overall, reviewers loved this game. And it was proven by the 10 major awards the various versions of Cthulhu have racked up over the years. This includes a 1994 Hall of Fame award from Gamer's Choice and the Origins Hall of Fame in 1995. With that kind of luck, Chaosium decided to double down on the basic role-playing system in 1981, releasing Stormbringer. Based on the Elric of Melnabone books by Michael Moorcock, Stormbringer is as you might have guessed, a fantasy game. Using BRP for its core rules, Stormbringer added its own series of rules for magic for its world. Ken St. Andre, Lynn Willis, and Steve Perrin get the bulk of creator credit, though others contributed through the five editions of this game that Chaosium was responsible for. Mongoose Publishing released two versions of the game, called Elric of Melnabone, before they lost the license in 2011. Of all the reviews I found, there weren't very many people who disliked the game. Most of them found it easy to learn, run, and play, and they all recommended it for fans of fantasy role-playing games. Also in 1981, Hero Games introduced Champions. Inspired by Superhero 2044, which we discussed last week, it was one of the first published role-playing games where character creation was based solely on a point-by system. Other games prior to this had had a version of the system, but die rolls and other variables were also involved. Champions was the first pure point-by character creation system. So what is point-by? Simply put, at character creation, the player has a set number of points to use to build their character. In the case of champions, these are called character points, or CP. These points have to be spread out over characteristics, like strength or intelligence, 
skills like martial arts or knowledges, and to build your superpowers. The fact that there are a limited number of points means that the player has to really consider the type of character they want to play before they ever start creating because every choice matters. Now, getting back to champions, players had to do something else new and different in character creation. They had to come up with character disadvantages. This meant that characters would have friends, enemies, strengths, and weaknesses at the start of the game. How's that different? Well, before this, players would have their friends and their strengths, depending on the kind of game, but disadvantages and weaknesses were typically determined by the game master, and the GM would determine when to bring those into the game and drop them on the players. Set in Millennium City, this game was a true superhero game with all the trappings of a superhero world. The first edition of Champions won rave reviews, Subsequent versions, uh, their reviews varied from rave to meh to no. Six editions in all have been printed. Oh, and, and I missed this earlier. The game was originally designed by Steve Peterson, George MacDonald, Bruce Horlick, and Ray Greer. Now, Champions was important for another reason, as it spun off what is known as the Hero System. It was first published separately from Champions in 1990, but I'm including it here because its creation came from Champions. In fact, if you look at 1st Edition Champions and 4th Edition Hero System, that's called 4th Edition because it was the 4th Edition of Champions that came out at the time and they wanted to keep pace. It's weird publisher stuff. Anyway, stay with me. Compare 1st Edition Champions, 4th Edition Hero System. Mechanically, they are the same. The difference is that Hero System was pared down to make it work as a plug-in for other systems. Stephen S. Long gets designer credit for this, and the system has had four editions of its own. Now, I'll dig deeper into Hero System when we cover games in the 1990s and 2000s, so we're just going to go with what we've got right here and, and, and leave it be. 1983 saw Palladium Books enter the gaming market with the Palladium Fantasy role-playing game, or... Palladium Fantasy, for short. With many of the same classes and races as the other games on the market, Palladium Fantasy set itself apart from the others with its setting. Set in the Palladium world, it has a history divided into multiple ages that have different levels of magical energy, ergo different levels of magical availability for characters. This book gives great accounting of that history so that you can use it in the game. Geography and politics are also well established, again, giving a good, solid base of knowledge for the GM and for players to use in the game. Palladium Fantasy had a huge staff of creators. I mean, a lot of them. So many so that trying to name them all would take longer, probably, than this podcast is going to. So for the first and hopefully only time... I'm going to send you to Palladium's website at palladiumbooks.com if you want to see the full list of creators, which you should because they deserve that credit. Palladium Fantasy has had three editions, with the most recent dropping in 1996. It should be noted that all of the first edition books and supplements are out of print. I know. Duh, you kind of expected it was first edition. However, at last check, you can still find second edition materials for sale, and nine times out of ten, you're going to find it brand spanking new. Reviews of Palladium Fantasy are mostly positive. The biggest gripe about the first edition concerned the price, which was $20 US. That was pretty high at the time for a soft cover game book that was just a game book. I mean, normally for that price, you'd get some other stuff like dice, maps, or some other kinds of goodies that you could use in the game. 1983 saw Victory Games enter the playing field with the release of James Bond 007. No, I gotta stop. I, I, I really can't afford a lawsuit. Anyway, set in the James Bond world of the movies and books, players could play as Bond, James Bond himself. Other options were other MI6 agents or agents from allied agencies, such as the American CIA. As in the books and movies, the goal was to thwart the forces of evil attempting to take over the world and look damn good doing 
no, all right, forget the second part. It was all the first part. Thwart the forces of evil attempting to take over the world. What really makes 007 different from other games is that it really wasn't suited for the standard four-person party. The way the game was built was really intended for one-on-one -on -one gameplay, which would be one player and one GM. However, two players could be supported with a little bit of extra effort from the GM. Avalon Hill, the parent company of Victory Games, worked really hard to be as authentic to the Bond world as it could, securing rights not only from Dan Jack Eon Productions, who owned the film rights, but also from what is now Ian Fleming Productions. They control the literary rights. Gameplay and character creation are similar to other games, though they were obviously modified for the spy genre. Gerard Christopher King gets the designer credit for this game, and it should be noted it got a ton of adventures and supplemental material during its lifetime, including supplements specific to each of the movies that had been released to that point, with the exception of Never Say Never Again, and that's a whole rights issue thing I don't even want to try to get into. The game also sold well internationally. Before it was all said and done, it sold over 100,000 copies worldwide. Unfortunately, it went out of print in 1987 due to the license not being renewed. That, by the way, is still a big argument between Dan Jack and Avalon Hill because each of them says the other is the reason that partnership didn't continue. The only absolute truth I know is that the licensing deal was allowed to expire, and when that happens, it ends a game. 007 was well-reviewed, was noted for its price point, its ease of play, and its layout, and it won awards from Origins and the Strategist Club in 1984. So if you can find a used copy, give it a run. Hey, speaking of 1984, let's head back over to Hero Games. They published Justice, Inc., which is a game based on the adventure stories in pulp magazines of the 1930s. Written by Aaron Alston, Steve Peterson, and Michael Stackpole, Justice, Inc. was one of the first non-superhero games to use the point-based system from Champions. Of course, that makes sense, because they shared a publisher. Now, while Justice, Inc. used the same point-based system, the point totals they used were lower, and this game placed more emphasis on skills and talents to take advantage of the paranormal aspects of the pulp fiction genre. Justice, Inc. got two editions published for it before the line was allowed to slowly go out of print. However, Hero Games, after much pressure from gamers, published a pulp hero game book that covers pretty much everything from Justice, Inc.'s books in 2005. Justice, Inc. got solid reviews. Reviewers appreciated the variety and setting, but always seemed to believe the game was lacking something. West End Games joined the role-playing game crowd in 1984, releasing a game that still resonates with gamers. Paranoia. Created by Greg Kostigan, Dan Gelber, and Eric Goldberg, Paranoia is set in a dystopian future. However, unlike other games in that particular genre, Paranoia also has a dark, tongue-in-cheek humor about it. The first major difference between Paranoia and other role-playing games is that the players in a Paranoia game are competing against each other more than they are cooperating with each other. The PCs are given missions from the computer, which is the game's main antagonist. The missions tend to be incomprehensible, self-contradictory, or obviously just straight-up fatal when you try to complete them. The computer can, and often does, assign side missions that conflict completely with the main mission. Oh, and if that wasn't enough, characters are often assigned equipment that is faulty, dangerous, or experimental. Uh, read into that both faulty and dangerous. On top of all of that, each character can, and usually does, have a separate agenda from the other characters, which, of course, puts them all potentially into conflict. Oh, and did I mention that failing to complete the computer's assigned mission will result in death? Yeah, Paranoia is a game that is very appropriately named. Oh, also, each character has six clones, which are used to replace the character when it dies. And it will die, as will all the clones, eventually. 
Needless to say, this all creates a soup of dark humor that runs throughout the gameplay. And Paranoia is one of those games where it is either just loved or people didn't get it. Paranoia has gone through six editions. West End Games published three of them, titled 1st, 2nd, and 5th edition. 5th was a, a joke. Mongoose Publishing has the other three, most recently in 2017, thanks to a very successful Kickstarter campaign. Reviewers loved it, and it won the Origins Award for Best Role-Playing Rules of 1984. It was also inducted into the Origins Award Hall of Fame in 2007. Now, last week, we stepped out of the timeline a few times to look at other aspects of role-playing games, and I, I want to do that again this week. The role-playing game-themed adventure book got some competition in 1982 as two lines began publishing against the Choose Your Own Adventure line. Endless Quest, published by TSR Hobbies, had a 36-book first series that ran from June 1982 to March of 1987. These books were mostly D&D, but a few other TSR properties were thrown in as well, like Top Secret and Gamma World. There was also a four-book special series, Crimson Crystal Adventures, published from March to September of 1985. A second series ran from 1994 to 1995, and it had two books planned for 1996, but they never got released. Another run came from Wizards of the Coast in 2018, and that run is still being printed. Fighting Fantasy entered the fray in 1982, Steve Jackson, not to be confused with the Steve Jackson of Steve Jackson Games, and Ian Livingston created this line, adding in a twist. The reader had to create a character with six-sided dice, then use the dice to resolve skill and combat challenges throughout the story. The reader also had to keep track of inventory, as certain quests could only be accomplished if certain items had been obtained. Puffin Books was the original publisher, releasing 59 books between 1982 and 1995. After a break, Wizard Books acquired the rights. They reprinted most of the originals between 2002 and 2007, then published 17 new titles from 2009 to 2012. Scholastic Books got the rights in 2017, re-releasing five of the original books, and to date... 11 new titles have been released. The 1980s also brought a new medium to the role-playing game, the computer. Akalabath, World of Doom, is considered by most to be one of the first examples of a role-playing video game. Created by Richard Garriott while he was still a junior in high school in Texas, Akalabath was originally created in AppleSoft Basic. For those of you who know what AppleSoft Basic is. I'm not one of them. Over the years, he evolved it, then was eventually convinced to sell the game by his boss at the computer land he worked at in Clear Lake City, Texas. These first copies were packaged in Ziploc bags and sold for $20 US. Eventually, California Pacific Computer Company got a copy, and they contracted to publish that game. Garriott got $5 for every copy sold. It retailed for $35 US, and Garriott claims the game sold 30,000 copies, thus netting him a cool 150 grand. This game's revolutionary in many ways. It first person perspective. It had use of color for different levels, which it kind of had to because the game was primarily dots and dashes. You know, early 80s? Come on. Many video game historians also give Akalabeth the position as the first game in the Ultima series. Also in 1980, Epics released Rogue, which had originally been developed by Michael Toy and Glenn Wickman, with a little later help from Ken Arnold. This Epics version lists AI design as the developers, and that's Toy and Wickman along with John Lane. Rogue has players controlling a character through several levels of dungeons, seeking the Amulet of Yendor. There are monsters and treasures and... oh my. I'm just kidding. All of that combined really does make Rogue a role-playing game. And two things you need to note about Rogue. It's turn-based, so that gave the player time to make decisions. Not a whole lot of time, but time. And that was important because the second thing, 
death was permanent, so those decisions were pretty daggum important. The graphics were really good for the time, and the gameplay was reported to be really good as well. Reviewers liked the game, and while I couldn't find any, I would lay bets that somebody out there on the interwebs has this version available for play today. And with that, we're going to bring this week's tour to an end. Don't worry, though. We're going to finish the 1980s in two weeks. I say two weeks because next week we need to take a break from the timeline. More to the point, I need to take a break from all the research for timelines and do a deep dive on two notable game companies, Avalon Hill and Judges Guild. Now, as we wrap up this week, I need to send a shout out to the two guys who inspired me to start this podcast. Mike Duncan, who hosts the Revolutions Historical Podcast, and Conrad Thompson, who is the podfather of pro wrestling podcasts. But of course, the biggest shout out goes to you. Without you, I'm just sitting here in front of my computer talking to myself, and that really kind of bothers my wife and daughter when I do that. Yeah, kind of does. Anyway, sorry. Uh, Don't forget to give the show positive reviews wherever you listen. It is always appreciated. And tell all your friends to listen in. Oh, and for those who've asked, and there have been several, Anchor is my podcast source, and they have reported issues with iTunes. So I still have no idea when in the hell we're going to be on iTunes. I am considering taking matters into my own hands, setting up an account with iTunes and an account with Audible, so that this podcast can be available on those sites. So stay tuned, and I will let you know when I do that. You can check us out on Facebook and on Instagram, or you can at us on Twitter at Roleplaying History Podcast. I'll chat on there with you. I swear I will. So I guess that means I don't get to say don't at me anymore. You can also email the show with questions or ideas at roleplayinghistorypodcast at gmail.com. I hope to have a website up for the show in the next couple of weeks, but I am not the most tech-savvy dude, so that means I'm going to lean on my tech-savvy daughter, and that could get interesting, so we shall see. But next week, we're going to take a look at the game companies Avalon Hill and Judges Guild. That's next week. And until then, thank you so very much for listening. I'm Wayne Davis, and you're role-playing history.